Greetings and welcome to the Red Hill Biopharma Limited Conference. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Chief Business Officer Guy Goldberg. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. You may begin. Thanks very much. Thank you to SNN uh, for uh, hosting us today. Uh, we're excited to be here. There's a lot of exciting things that we will be sharing with you about what's going on with the company uh, uh, right now. Before we do that, uh, I will be making uh, some forward-looking statements. Uh, please see our filings for a full disclosure of the risk. Red Hill today is a very exciting moment in our uh, company's history. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's so much we can talk about, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on a few things. First will be our uh, development and progression from being an R&D company into being uh, what we hope soon will be the leading GI specialty company. We've done that by getting Telicia, our lead product, approved, and then bringing in two additional commercial GI products as well. So we have now a full commercial uh, infrastructure, three exciting products that I'll be talking about today, and we're uh, getting ready to uh, grow revenues and ramp up. Um, we're in the infectious disease space, which is gaining momentum, uh, a lot of awareness of the importance that it has both in public health and also in the financial markets today, they're also taking note. So a lot going on in the commercial side of things that I'll be talking about. In addition, there is our COVID-19 program, which we've uh, been generating a lot of uh, uh, press releases about because there's a lot of movement there, a lot of progress. We're moving very fast. Most notably, we're in the middle of a phase two study in the United States. We've already announced that recruitment is going well. We're, we're past uh, a quarter of the way of, uh, of recruitment, and also our phase two, three global study. <clears throat> that one is also very important, a larger, more robust study and up to 270 patients. And that one we've also now announced that we've initiated. So these are two very important programs that if we're successful, we think will really uh, change the landscape for how COVID-19 is treated. Uh, there's a lot behind the programs, a lot behind the thinking, and even some compassionate use data in COVID-19 patients that we'll be sharing. So where is, what is our goal? Our goal is to become a leading GI company. Uh, we do that with our commercial products that I mentioned and also with our, our R&D program. We have a lot of late stage R&D products uh, that we're moving and that we've generated good data for. I'll only talk about uh, some of that today, again, in the interest of time, uh, but we have uh, a lot going on for a small company. This next slide is, a, is a, a snapshot of our full pipeline. Um, as you can see here, uh, there's the first full, there's the three initial commercial products that I mentioned we're promoting. That's Telicia for H. pylori infections in adults, Movantic, which is a product we acquired from AstraZeneca uh, for opioid-induced constipation. This is a very important indication, and AstraZeneca invested uh, a lot of resources to make sure this would be the brand leader, which it is. We're very lucky to be taking that product over, building on the enormous um, efforts and resources that AstraZeneca put into this product, and now taking over as a Red Hill product and, and continuing that tradition. And then finally, Amcolo, which is an exciting new product for traveler's diarrhea. Traveling, of course, is, is cut down quite considerably right now because of the, of the pandemic. So this is a product that we'll see today uh, soon when the traveling, uh, when travel comes back. In addition, we have uh, a full pipeline of products. I will point its attention specifically to our NPM infection program, uh, that's RHD204. We just announced FDA clearance on this very important program. There's no currently approved first-line drug for NPM disease, and we could be uh, that product. Um, we have uh, a study that's been cleared, that's a, a potential pivotal phase three study, and we're very excited to get that report. This I mentioned that our, our, our goal, our vision is to become a leading uh, specialty GI company. This is our plan for how we get there. We start small, we grow big, and then we have a lot of uh, thinking about our future development and, and where we want to be in five, ten years. So you see uh, those first couple products that we, that we promoted initially when we got the, the company going, the commercial operations going. Um, 
And then we moved on to Ancolo to listen to Movantic, which is what we're promoting right now with our sales force of 100 reps and 30 field support professionals. And we see our pipeline, products that we want to get approved in the future and will be uh, the foundation for future growth in the company. A lot going on. Uh, very important for, for investors, for you guys out there to understand who we are uh, our, and, and what our goals are, which is to become the leading GI specialty farming company out there and the important momentum that we've generated and that we're generating right now to achieve that goal. These are, this next slide is our financial highlights. Uh, our cash balance is $53 million as of June 30th. Uh, so that's an important uh, cash safety cushion that we have uh, to be able to promote our, our uh, commercial products uh, and also advance our pipeline. So I'll come back to, uh, to Yaliva, uh, to Opagonid. This is our drug for, um, for COVID-19 that I mentioned. It's a first-in-class oral drug uh, that has a dual mechanism of action and that it's both anti-inflammatory and it's antiviral. As I, move, as I mentioned, we're moving very fast with this one. Uh, we're already in a phase two, well into enrolling a phase two study in the United States, and we've initiated a global phase two, three study, and we believe we'll have data as early as Q4 from both of them, of course, assuming that recruitment uh, goes as planned. So a little bit more about uh, opagonin. Uh, it's an SK2 inhibitor. Uh, it's a product that we acquired uh, and our, our partner for it, who originally developed it, Apogee, did a tremendous amount of work uh, preclinically for it. So we know that it's active uh, in a whole uh, bunch of, uh, of uh, disease state models. Uh, and the ones that initially interacted with one, us were, were both the oncology and, and some anti-inflammatory models in GI. Um, with the development of the pandemic, uh, we, we looked at some of that work that were, was, were done, and we were surprised and pleasantly surprised to see how relevant it was uh, to, uh, to COVID-19 and some of the characteristics uh, we see in COVID-19, both in types of the structure of, of the RNA of the virus and also in terms of the, the way that the product is, is active uh, as an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, it's also been shown to be effective as an antiviral agent in preclinical models and in a number of virus models, including Ebola, flu, and chikungunya. So all of this gave us a lot of confidence to uh, make this drug available uh, to patients on a compassionate use basis, which we did. Uh, we did that here in Israel. And the results were, were very exciting. Um, we were able to show uh, that in, in the patients that were evalu evaluated, and I'll show this on the, on the next slide, it's just loading right now, and the patients that were evaluated, uh, six of them who were, who were hospitalized patients, uh, they were all uh, on oxygen, all of them having severe to critical uh, infection. After uh, receiving treatment, all of them were able to be taken off oxygen and discharged from the hospital. And we, lo we looked at what was going on um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of their blood. They had higher lymphocyte counts and decreased uh, C-reactive protein, which is exactly what you'd want to see uh, in, in, uh, in recovered patients. So that was very exciting, although a handful of patients and it wasn't a, a, pre, um, a prospective study, but that was enough to give us uh, um, confidence to proceed into a phase two study, which I mentioned that we have uh, up and running right now. That's in 40 hospitalized patients in the United States. Um, and that study uh, recruitment is, is going well. And we're very excited to be able to, uh, to get to the finish line with that one. In addition, uh, we began a larger, more robust 270 subject global study. Uh, we already have that study approved in the UK and Russia. And we have applications ongoing in Italy, Mexico, and Brazil, and we're looking at other places as well. This is a very uh, important study because of the, of the, of the scale uh, and, the, and the global uh, nature of the, the design of the study. We think it's very important. We're very excited to get that going. And as I mentioned, uh, our goal is to have uh, data as soon as Q4 for both of these studies in COVID-19. So we hope that will be a, a, an important contribution uh, that Red Hill is able to make to this global pandemic. Uh, there's great uh, scientific and medical support for why this drug should work, 
and now we have to prove it. That's what we're trying to do, and we hope to have results soon and, uh, and hopefully some exciting results to share. Moving back to our uh, commercial operations, uh, this is kind of the bread and butter of, of what we do. As a GI company, we, we identify uh, diseases of unmet medical need. We develop drugs, or in some cases, we acquire them where they make sense, and we build a, a portfolio of products that are uh, addressing um, areas of unmet medical need in the GI space. And these three products you see here are the ones uh, I'll talk a little bit about now. So that's Telicia for um, H. pylori infection, Movantic for opioid-induced constipation, and Colo for traveler's diarrhea. It's important to say that we're exciting, excited and expecting to see a ramp up of sales. Um, we're continuing as the, as the country is, is learning to, to continue to, to operate with precaution instead of shutdown. Uh, there's a lot of excitement that we have in-house for Movantic. In fact, uh, many of you may have seen the, the press release we just did on our, uh, on our uh, discussions with Daiichi uh, and, and the changing of the agreement in order to give us better economics and more control of the product. That's because of our confidence and excitement around Movantic. It's a brand leader, and we believe with the focus that we can give uh, that this uh, product will continue to be a, a leader in the space and for many years to come. Also, Talisa, we're very excited about that one. Uh, this is a product that we've spent a lot of time uh, preparing um, the, the, the medical community for, uh, whether that be at, a, at conferences through our uh, medical um, scientific liaisons and since approval to our, our sales team. Uh, we've done a lot of work here, and as the country uh, opens up and as GI clinics uh, become uh, um, more uh, more open to, uh, to general flow of patients, we believe that the, the, the ramp up of sales there will be important and, and very, uh, very meaningful. So a few words about, uh, about Movantic. Movantic is a product that was launched uh, by AstraZeneca in 2015. It was approved uh, in 2014. And the goal of this product was to address uh, a problem that patients who take opioids face. Opioids uh, have some controversy, but for the most part, it really is the gold standard uh, in the United States for moderate to severe pain. Uh, it works uh, well uh, where, when, it, when used appropriately. Uh, the, the problem with opioids is that the same effect that it has on the central nervous system, which is to alleviate pain, it also interferes uh, with receptors uh, in, the, in the GI system that help with uh, motility. And as a result, a very significant percent of patients, something like 40 to 80 percent of patients who uh, take opioids, uh, develop uh, severe develop constipation, and in many cases, severe constipation. In some cases, they have to reduce or discontinue use of opioids. So there, there was a strong need in the market for a drug to address this specific issue. Uh, and what is the issue? How can you uh, alleviate the effect of constipation without uh, um, undermining the, the um, pain alleviating effects of opioids? And that was, was what was done by, the, by Movantic, the first of the Pomora drugs that was approved. AstraZeneca did a, a large amount of investment in order to establish it as, as a leader, uh, which it is. In 2019, it generated $96 million in net sales. Uh, we're very excited to take this over. Uh, our team, uh, consisting of a lot of uh, the senior leadership from, from Salix, which was the leading GI company, are very familiar with the space of, of OIC, opioid-induced constipation, and, and, and we are very bullish on what Red Hill can do uh, with this product. Moving on to, uh, to Talisia. Talisia is a product that is an in-house product we, uh, we took it over and, and did, conducted two phase three studies, uh, both of them uh, very effective and formed the basis of our submission to FDA, which approved uh, our drug on time uh, in November. What are, what are we trying to do here? H. pylori is a very widespread uh, bacterial infection. Uh, it infects um, probably about a third of the United States. Uh, probably around two to three million people get treated for it every year, uh, and it's important 
bacteria to be treated because it is the primary cause of gastric cancer and the primary cause of peptic ulcer disease and, and, other, and, other issue, and causes other issues. And the problem is that the standard of care that's used right now, which is a, a triple combination of clarithromycin, amoxicillin, and a PPI, has faced an increasing problem of resistance. And this is something that's seen uh, all over sort of the, the world of infectious disease. You develop uh, a good uh, drug, a good antibiotic, and over time, uh, the bacteria uh, is able to uh, develop resistance to it. Uh, this is an area that's been largely neg neglected by the pharma world in terms of development, and that's why this drug is so important. We're coming in and we're addressing a, a true unmet medical need, which is uh, resistance to the standard of care and the need for a new treatment that overcomes that resistance problem. And we've done that. How have we done that? We've taken out uh, the problematic component of the standard of care that causes uh, resistance and introduced a new uh, component which in our studies has shown uh, no resistance uh, from, from the bacteria. So we're very excited about, about making this the new gold standard, the new first line treatment for H. pylori. Uh, importantly, we have market exclusivity for a minimum of eight years under the FDA QIVP designation and we have patent protection going out to 2034. So we think that this product could be a huge commercial success uh, for Red Hill uh, and also great for patients. And we've already started promoting it. This is, in fact, you see here our, our marketing piece. Uh, we're promoting it to 25,000 GI doctors, primary care physicians, and other healthcare providers. And we're focusing very much on managed care coverage as that is a critical uh, component of success for this product. This, as I mentioned, is the sort of the background of why this is an important uh, disease to address. Uh, you're talking about uh, gastric cancer, uh, the primary cause of gastric cancer uh, in the world, and a big problem of resistance. We see standard of care failing in 25 to 40 percent of patients. It's a huge number, a very big problem for doctors that, that face this. Uh, both the WHO and the FDA have identified H. pylori as a, as a key pathogen for, for developing new treatments. In fact, that's how we get uh, the special status we have with FDA, and that's how we were able to get priority review, uh, fast track designation. Uh, it's recognized among uh, thought leaders as a, an important public health, con health concern, and as I mentioned, uh, really neglected by, by the pharma community as a place for drug development. So where do we stand? We have a drug that is effective. Uh, we have addressed the, the drug that addresses the concerns of resistance. It's approved. It has a great tolerability and safety profile, and we believe it will become the first time uh, gold standard treatment and this very important indication with the huge unmet medical need. So we are excited to take it forward. Uh, the next product I'll just mention very briefly is Ancolo. It's the third product in our commercial portfolio. We think it's a great product. Uh, it was brought to us uh, by, uh, by Cosmo a leading GI company in Europe, a great partner for Red Hill. They also made a strategic investment in Red Hill, and, and they serve on our board. Uh, we think they're going to be a great partner for us going forward, and, and this is a great part product as well. Uh, it's a product that addresses uh, a problem uh, with, with travelers, especially travelers to places that are, are uh, not developing, not developed countries, um, and, and that is travelers' diarrhea. Uh, caused by uh, E. coli. Um, of course, right now, uh, people aren't traveling because of the pandemic, so uh, this product is going to see its uh, day, it's going to have its day in, in, in the sun, but it's not right now, not while people are, are staying home. Uh, but however, we are uh, doing all of our work preparing for, for the day when traveling returns. Um, and I would mention again a couple of the key characteristics uh, of this product. Um, it tr addresses traveler's diarrhea, and it's superior to what's out there with products such as Cipro uh, and azithromycin because it's minimally absorbed. So it's a targeted delivery system. You don't have to take a systemic antibiotic, and that has uh, a number of advantages that we think will, will, be, will make it a very exciting product for, for physicians and for patients. Uh, going a little bit into our pipeline, we just have a few minutes left, so uh, I'll speak uh, briefly about our pipeline. As I mentioned, we have a lot of products 
that we're developing. Uh, this includes uh, RHB 104 for Crohn's disease. Uh, we had a successful phase three product, uh, phase three study that we that we finished, and now we're working on a, a development of a diagnostic for for MAP, which is the putative cause of Crohn's disease. And what we think we've shown uh, pretty pretty well in our study plays a, a critical role in Crohn's disease. Um, RHB 102 or Bakimba for gastroenteritis and IBSD. We've had successful phase three and phase two studies there. And we also have a bowel cleanser program, RHB 106. That's our full pipeline. And then the, in the interest of time, I'll talk about uh, the last component of our pipeline uh, briefly. And this one we just had a, a press release about, so it's very timely, which is RHB 204 for NTM infections. Why is this an important uh, um, disease and, and topic? Um, well, NTM or pulmonary non-tuberculous mycobacterium disease caused by a MAC infection is, uh, is a relatively new disease, uh, but it's one that affects uh, uh, over 100,000 uh, patients in the United States, and there's no approved first-line therapy. So this is uh, a, a disease that has a strong need um, for, uh, for, for a, a treatment and to, to give uh, physicians treatment options. Now, the, the good thing is that this is, has some similar components to what we've developed for and, 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 and done a successful study in Crohn's. So we know how these drugs work together. Uh, we know the safety profile, and that's why we're confident to take this product straight into a, a phase three pivotal study. Uh, again, about NTM, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problematic uh, disease. Uh, some of the symptoms include fever, weight loss, um, coughing of blood. Uh, it's, it's chronic. It really doesn't go away by itself. And as I mentioned, over 100,000 patients in the United States. Uh, so really a, a disease with the need for a new treatment. This is the uh, phase three study uh, that we had uh, an announcement about. Uh, the FDA gave us clearance uh, to proceed with this uh, pivotal phase three study, and we plan to initiate it in Q3. 125 uh, subjects uh, in newly diagnosed um, or recent repeat um, uh, uh, positive uh, MAC disease. Uh, very important um, study, very important drug. If we're approved, uh, we, we could be the first uh, drug to be approved as a first-line therapy for it, and we think that will have enormous value, uh, not just to, uh, to, to patients, and, and, uh, but also to our shareholders in terms of the, the value it will have uh, for the company to be a leader in, in the space. So, so to sum up where, where we are, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to questions. We're, uh, we're a, a leading and, and a GI company. Uh, we're growing very quickly. We have a number of things uh, happening, a number of milestones happening this year that we think will be pivotal for the company. First is around our COVID studies. We have a phase two uh, that we've already uh, started recruiting and well into recruiting, a phase two, three study uh, that we've initiated, uh, both a global study, and both of those uh, could be yielding data as early as Q4. In addition, we have a commercial ramp-up that's going on now with, uh, with the, the, the country opening up or at least uh, learning how to, uh, to, to live life uh, and manage uh, with the disease ongoing. And that's important as, as we think this will be a fast-growing product and will, will, uh, will lead to a revenue growth that will be very important and exciting for the company and our shareholders. Uh, we're in the space of infectious disease, which is very important right now, uh, both from a public health perspective and also from a financial perspective. And we think we're, we're right in the place we need to be uh, as a company to, uh, to generate growth and value for our shareholders, uh, both in the immediate term and uh, the, the middle and long term. So with that, uh, let me uh, see if there are any questions. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll go from there. So let's see, the first question that, that we have here, and these are questions that came to us, by the way, uh, through uh, uh, written in, so I'll just re read what the people who wrote them uh, asked. Uh, is there any progress uh, regarding, I think you meant helicobacter, or helicopter, helicobacter, helicobacter testing in the U.S., and how do sales agents work at this time? Yeah, this is a, an important question. Uh, one of the um, 
one of the uh, uh, consequences of, of the shutdown uh, was not just that uh, patients were, were significantly reducing uh, their interactions with physicians and not going in to see physicians uh, when in the past they might have, but also a lot of the laboratory and diagnostic testing um, was not being done. So for uh, H. pylori in particular, that's problematic because uh, treatment is, is given typically after you diagnose a uh, patient. So we do see uh, diagnostics coming back online, so that's very important. I think it's, it's increasingly being recognized that, uh, especially in, in the healthcare world, uh, life has to move on and you have to find a way to move on safely rather than just shut down testing or shut down a GI doctors, offices, and things like that. So we are seeing things come back on. We are seeing our reps coming back into the field, not at the level of activity we want them to be, uh, but they are coming back into the field. Um, uh, some of them in, in areas where uh, there is a significant uh, infection rate are, are having to do more work from home, but in many places we see uh, reps uh, returning to, to the field and, and calling on doctors and we see the trends uh, positive and growing, so that's important. Second question, also from, from the same person, uh, when will there be results for the phase two study uh, in the U.S. in COVID-19? Uh, thanks very much. So recruiting on that study is going uh, very well, and we believe as soon as Q4 uh, we should have results. Of course, that depends on recruiting uh, continuing to go as, as we've seen it go, but we're, we're optimistic. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, patients, unfortunately, in the U.S. In the US who are hospitalized and, and looking for, for uh, treatment options, and, and they've uh, been uh, a good source for us for, for these studies. Next question. What was uh, Red Hill's rationale to acquire Movantic from AstraZeneca? Um, that's another good question. Um, so uh, Movantic, so we built, um, originally we were developing Telicia. And when we, we saw we had a winner in our hands and we, we, we had pretty high degree of confidence that this drug uh, would be approved, which we did, uh, we realized that, that in building an infrastructure, we could leverage that infrastructure for economies of scale and find an additional product. So our, our ideal profile of a product would be one that was already established. Uh, with Telicia, you grow the brand. So if you can find a product that's a, a, you know, well-established or even a brand leader, uh, it's a great compliment, and we were very lucky to find that. Movantic is a brand leader, so we benefit from the enormous amount of effort that, that AstraZeneca has put into it, and we can take it and, and just ride that and try to grow, grow those sales. So it really is very complimentary. Uh, in addition, if you look at the prescribers who we think will be writing Telicia and those who have written uh, Movantic already, and this is an analysis we've done, when you overlap those lists, there's a very high correlation. So we think that our reps will be able to promote both products very well. In fact, all of our reps are responsible for, uh, for both products. Uh, the next question, um, how does Telicia differentiate uh, from current H. pylori treatments, and why is it important to eradicate the bacteria? Yeah, so Telicia is, is very, very different um, uh, from, from the standard of care out there. As I mentioned, Probably 80-85% of patients who are treated uh, for H. pylori are treated with the standard of care. That standard of care is clarithromycin, uh, maxillin, and PPI. That is a substandard treatment. There's a high rate of, of, uh, of resistance to that, to that standard of care. So as I mentioned, it can be as high as 30-40% uh, uh, and maybe even beyond in some places in the United States resistance to standard of care. In addition, uh, the, the one component of that standard of care, clothomycin, uh, belongs to a macrolide class of uh, bacteria, and, and the, the guidelines uh, provided by the American College of Gastroenterology actually say uh, they guide away from using that, which is a, a very strange situation where you have the, the leading um, uh, GI uh, um, thought leading body guiding away from the standard of care uh, that's used in 80-85%. And why do they do that? Because it's, it really is substandard, but there really are no, no options. So we really believe that we will be the first-line gold standard. We overcome uh, the deficiencies of the current standard of care, and, and we, we, we think that it will be a great product, uh, and, and we'll just very quickly replace that, that standard of care. 
I'm running a little bit out of time. Uh, so let me see, there was one question. Uh, what is the main inflection point? I think this will be the last one we take. What is the main inflection point investors should look for? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, there are a number that are coming out uh, that, that I would think about. Uh, the, the first one is relates to our uh, COVID-19 uh, program. As I mentioned, we have two uh, clinical studies that we're doing, a phase two study in the United States that's recruiting patients, and the second one, a global phase two, three study. Uh, both of them, we believe, uh, will be reading out uh, before, uh, by, by Q4, um, and uh, that could uh, perform uh, the basis for, for submission for, for emergency use authorization. So that would be a very, those two uh, data readouts are very important. In addition, uh, we'll, you know, right now, since we're a commercial operation, we'll continue to have uh, ongoing uh, earnings calls every quarter, as we've always been doing. And, and those earnings calls will be updating the, the revenue and, and, and other metrics on our products. And those will be important products as we transition from uh, R&D company that, that burns cash to a cash, cash flow po positive company eventually. So seeing that transitioning happening over the, source, over the course of all these earning calls that we've been doing, I think that will be a very important and meaningful uh, uh, inflection point that, that investors should pay attention to. And then the last will be, I think, on the R&D side, uh, specifically with, uh, with NTM, for example, where we, will be, um, we should be starting our uh, pivotal phase three study in Q3. That's a very important uh, study for the company. Uh, as I mentioned, there are no approved uh, first-line treatments. It's a disease uh, that is urgently in need of, uh, of a standard of care. Uh, and we believe we could be that standard of care. We have a drug that really is well positioned uh, to, to be that. So we're excited to get that study going and then eventually uh, report uh, results on it. So those are, uh, those are the inflection points that I would look for. So again, I want to thank everybody for listening in and uh, for the great questions. Uh, the company is always available uh, uh, to answer questions and, and to address any, uh, any topics that, that you guys wish. Thanks very much and have a great morning.